let's do it. So first of all, welcome to the uh, 2022 Myers Lecture Series interview with Dr. Linda Kasser. And uh, I'm Dr. Jeff Myers, and uh, my wife Joyce and I sponsor Myers Lecture Series, now honoring our 14th lecturer. So welcome, and congratulations to you. Thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to have you with us, and uh, an honor and honor you as part of the Myers Lecture Series. So Thank you. thanks so much. So as we looked uh, at your uh, CV and uh, looked at some of the things that you've done in order to share with our audience, uh, we noted that uh, you graduated from Northwestern, mm -hmm. a Big Ten school, mm -hmm. then Indiana University School of Optometry with an OD, another Big Ten school, mm -hmm. and then completed a two-year residency at the Wilson Health Center in Rochester, New York. Served on faculty of three different optometry schools and colleges in a variety of positions, including as dean, and also on faculty for a physician assistant program. Mm -hmm. uh, your love of the anterior segment of the eye and ocular disease and primary care has taken you to eight countries to lecture and give presentations, 39 states in the US, and uh, presenting almost 400 times. So must have had more than one lecture prepared. Right? <laughs> That's good. Um, dozens of publications, including being the primary author of the textbook Atlas of Primary Eye Care Procedures in 97, and the ebook then in 2017. Uh, service, past president of the Indiana Optometric Association, past chair of the Academy, uh, primary care diplomate program, uh, president of National Board of Examiners in Optometry, uh, board of directors of the Association of Schools and Colleges of Optometry, uh, international service, serving on the assessment team uh, for the Optometry Council of Australia and New Zealand, and then interprofessional service, which I found, find very intriguing, uh, as a public member of the Commission on Dental Accreditation of the American Dental Association. Mm -hmm. Just a few highlights of the service that you uh, have performed over the years. Recognitions over the years have been uh, named the Indiana and the American Optometric Association Optometrist of the Year. Uh, the State University of New York College of Optometry recognized you with their Distinguished Residency Alumni Award. Salus University recognized you with the Presidential Service to Students Award. Association of Schools and Colleges of Optometry recognize you twice with the Dr. Lester Kaplan Honorary Lecture Award and the Dr. Jack Bennett Innovation and Optometric Education Award. Pennsylvania Optometric Association with the De Dr. Jerry Davidoff Memorial Award. The American Academy of Optometry Primary Care Section with their Founders Award. And Indiana University just this past weekend with their Distinguished Alumni Award of the Year, correct? Not of the century of which we've been, <laughs> been warned. Okay. Thank so. you. So it's a pretty impressive series of achievements and accomplishments, but Linda, we really want to know more, okay? We really want to know more about the backstory and the history and how you came to be such an achiever uh, with an optometry. So the first burning question is really this. For a lady who grew up in Wisconsin, graduated from Northwestern, then from Indiana, and spent a good portion of her career in southeastern Pennsylvania near Penn State, which Big Ten football team are you really rooting for? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me buy a little time and mentally before I respond. <laughs> um, first of all, Dr. Myers, may I just say what an honor it is to be here and truly grateful to you and the college, to you for establishing the Myers Lecture tradition and to the college for their honoring of me. So thank you so much. And thank you Our for privilege. your very kind introduction. So I, as I'll share a little bit later, am a Buckeye football fan by marriage. Even if I weren't, that might be said today. But I do love Big Ten. Mm -hmm. And so I root for Northwestern. I root for IU. I root for the Buckeyes. And even though I'm not an alum of the University of Wisconsin, if depending who they're playing, then I do root for uh, Wisconsin as well. So truly enjoy college football, especially this time of year. So does that mean the Buckeyes are really the priority team that you're rooting for? I just want to be clear about this. I would say Remembering today, yes. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Perfect. That's, I think that's a perfect diplomatic answer. I like that. So, so Linda, why, why is it optometry that you chose as a profession? Uh, probably you could have chosen many professions, would probably have been successful in any of them, but why optometry? And if it wasn't optometry, what do you think it would have been? Well, I was a chemistry major at Northwestern, and I was a few years into my studies. I knew what I didn't want to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do and how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. So during my junior year, during holiday break, I went to the local campus of the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee mm -hmm. and looked at Health and Human Services Occupational Handbook. I concentrate on the health sciences mm -hmm. section, since I think like all of us in our profession, my hope was to help people. Mm 
and improve quality of life for, for people. So I'm flipping through and I see optometry. I said, hmm. I'd had one eye exam at that point at age 18 performed by an ophthalmologist. So I was looking through the page, it intrigued me. I photocopied it, took it home to my parents. And my dad, who was a patent attorney, said, there's an optometrist in my office building. His name was Dr. Sidney Nelson. So my dad arranged for me to visit his practice. He had a wonderful practice in downtown Milwaukee. And I was really captivated by what he did every day, seeing the looks on his patients' faces. So I applied to optometry school. If I had not, I was thinking at the time of maybe pharmacy. My uncle was a pharmacist, so I could see firsthand his, his professional endeavors. Um, but optometry really captured my attention. I didn't know as much about it going into it as I think most students do now, but right. it's just been wonderful for me. I think back in that day, we kind of picked it and really didn't know as much. You're right, I think we just didn't know as much as students do to today yes. about what we're getting into or what it's going to be like or anything like that. Yes, so. yes, yes. So after graduation from optometry school, you did a residency. Mm -hmm. In those days, a residency was a unique thing. I mean, mm -hmm. not everybody did one, and they weren't yes. plentiful at the time. Um, so why choose a residency, and, um, and how did you end up at the Wilson Health Center in Rochester? Yes. Well, at the time I graduated, 1978, I noted the profession embracing the use of pharmaceutical agents. I was very proud and comfortable with my education, but I wanted to learn more about ocular disease and how to manage it. And as you mentioned, I believe there are only about three residencies at the time. Uh, the Kansas City VA, SUNY's Visual Therapy Program, I think PCO may have had one at that time, as well as um, Dr. Catania's residency in Rochester, New York. So I applied just to his residency program and I was fortunate to be accepted and it was truly life-changing. I think that's true for those of us who do complete residency programs mm -hmm. in terms of the mentoring, our patient care opportunities, our confidence, truly life-changing. I had wonderful mentors um, that really paved the way for my career, which I'm truly grateful for. And so you worked side by side with Dr. Catania? Oh yes, yes. So he was chief of the eye services. The um, optometry service was the entree for eye care in the HMO, mm -hmm. the Joseph C. Wilson Health Center. So before, if they needed ophthalmological care, we examined them and made that referral. Um, I also worked with Marie Fingerette, who had completed the residency and was on staff mm -hmm. um, at the health center at that time. And a wonderful colleague named Barry Thorne, Dr. Barry Thorne, who was a tremendous clinician. Um, and um, Ted Woodcomb, mm -hmm. who um, Murray, Ted, and I co-authored the Atlas. Um, he was also on staff at the time. Just fabulous mentors, okay. wonderful clinical role models. And of course, as you know, Lou Catania is one of our former lecturers. Yes, 2017, so, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great guy. And, mm -hmm. and as I was early in the profession, I got to hear him lecture many, many, many times. Yes. And, uh, of course, he brings a certain energy to the lecture and mm -hmm. everything, and he's just a, a great individual as well. Yeah, and so. I'm pleased to say firsthand that energy, that passion, was there every day, mm -hmm. not just at the CE setting. And uh, again, all of us benefited tremendously, invaluably from that. Yeah. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. What do you think motivates you, um, and what are you passionate about? We could see some of those things maybe off of your CV and where your life is taking you, but. From your standpoint, what, what really motivates you and what are you passionate about? I think at a global level, my best response would be trying to do the best that I can, mm -hmm. no matter what. I would, I've, as you were kind enough to recount, I've had wonderful opportunities. I can't say it was always purposefully planned. Sometimes it was serendipitous. And certainly the service opportunities, those arose at different intervals often by me seeing others involved, often by them recommending for me to get involved. Um, my email signature includes a quote from Vince Lombardi, mm -hmm. circling back mm -hmm. to football, because I grew up with the Green Bay Packers well, so, when yeah. he was coach right, of right, the right, Packers. Right. Um, the quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, mm -hmm. irrespective of their chosen field of, the, of endeavor. So I'm sure like all of us, I try to do my very best no matter what. Mm -hmm. So. Even if I'm not totally familiar yet with my role, I try to be as familiar as I can, learn as much as I can, learn from others. You were kind enough to mention my work in interprofessional education. That came at a very interesting time in my career. 
um, and it happened about 30 years in. And it was really invigorating for me to learn more firsthand about other professions, those on our campus at Salis University and also working with collaborators off campus. So I would hope throughout my career that I've manifested my commitment to excellence. I would hope others would have noted it as well, but I think that's what motivates me and what I'm passionate about. And then certainly in my years as a clinical provider, just to make, as you know firsthand in your practice, just to make that difference. It, there's nothing like it. And uh, trying to be the best optometrist I could for the patients I served and who trusted, entrusted their care to me. You'll notice I didn't ask about your favorite professional football team. Right. I figured it was a Green Bay team. Yes, so, yeah, yes that's, that's true. <laughs> so uh, just to follow up on the ADA stuff, how does mm -hmm. an esteemed optometrist, high achiever in optometry, end up being on an American Dental Association committee mm -hmm. reviewing now endodontics? Mm -hmm. Because uh, in my education, I had no information about endodontics, so it's something you had to either learn or just your guiding or helping, I don't know, how do you end up getting that kind of gig? Yes, so when I was on the ASCO Board of Directors, I was asked to be on the OAT task force, the optometry admissions test, and I'm sure you're aware that the OAT is administered by the American Dental Association. Okay. So the task force had several meetings in Chicago at the ADA headquarters. Mm -hmm. So somehow I ended up on the ADA's morning email. They do an email in the morning like we get from the AOA. And I noticed probably about six years ago, they had a little box insert calling for public members of the Commission on Dental Accreditation, CODA. So I thought, okay, I'd like to apply. As you kindly mentioned, like others in our profession, I've had a lot of years of experience with the um, Accreditation Council on Optometry Education. Mm -hmm. I've um, been fortunate to do some international accrediting, and I thought I'd really like to test these waters. So two colleagues were kind enough to support my application. I was selected. It was a one-year orientation, very intensive. And then actually just last month, I finished my four-year term on CODA. It's a 30-member body. Um, I'm one of four public members, the first and only optometrist to serve on that commission. And it was really, truly interesting. A lot of hard work, like we know accreditation to be. Um, given the size of their profession, the accrediting body has a review committee structure. Uh, dozens of review committees actually review the site uh, team re results and offer recommendations to CODA. So we're the deliberative body. But it was, again, truly eye-opening, very enjoyable, met some wonderful new people. And I think Dakota's credit, they genuinely value public member perspective. So I was able to offer some perspectives. They did ask me to chair a subcommittee for them at one point. And I think what was interesting is I didn't have to, worry is probably the wrong word, but didn't have to worry about others perspectives on my comments because I was coming as a public member. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned endodontics, so they have the review committee structure, the RC structure. So in addition to my commission uh, role, which just concluded, I'm continuing as a review committee member on the endodontics committee, which again, smaller group, mm -hmm. um, which offers its recommendations to CODA, but it's again, very, very interesting. So how much do you really know about endodontics? Very little, but I know quite a bit about the structure of the committee. And <laughs> yes, yeah, so I don't know the content, but look at the um, accreditation related issues. Kind of the process. Is exactly. I got you. Yes, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be an expert dentist. Correct. Yeah, yes, which thankfully. Is, it's, it's, well, I was just wondering, you know, yeah. some of our member colleagues in the community are, I have two professions, you know, yeah. attorneys yeah. and optometrists. Yeah, you know, I don't know too many dentists and optometrists, but mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. There you go. And as we know, not to interrupt you, the role of accrediting bodies is to protect the public. Mm -hmm. right. and, I, and again, I, it's been really a wonderful experience to have that public member hat yeah. to an accrediting body. Well, it would be kind of fun because you've been on the inside of the accreditation mm -hmm. in optometry. Mm -hmm. You bring some skills that most optometrists would not have mm -hmm. and can function as a public member and still keep the safety foremost in mind. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's good. Thank you. Who are the early influencers and early mentors in your life? And maybe who are the influencers and mentors within your career? Well, I'd say certainly family, parents. Mm -hmm. um, 
again, I remember vividly when I was a chemistry major at Northwestern, not sure what my path would be. Um, my dad in particular, who was a patent attorney, was very encouraging of me to find a focus, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there was ever any question that hopefully I would have a career and a successful career. So certainly my family and my parents, mm -hmm. by role modeling, by their encouragement and their support. Mm -hmm. Then once I got to optometry school, uh, one of my faculty members was Dr. Irv Borsch, mm -hmm. again the inaugural Myers lecturer, mm -hmm. wonderful role model, wonder, wonderful mentor. I also had a wonderful mentor in Dr. Dan Gersman who taught the optics courses. Mm -hmm. And he invited me to serve as a teaching assistant in the optics courses, as well as in the low vision courses, which started my second year in optometry school. So that really initiated my interest in optometric education. Mm -hmm. And then, as you were kind enough to point out earlier, Dr. Lou Catania and other colleagues in my residency program, not only mentors and role models during that two-year intensive program, but opened doors for me beyond that throughout my career. And then I would say in all the roles I've had, I've had the opportunity to have the Indiana Opt Optometric Association when I joined as a young faculty member when I was back at IU in 1984, the AOA, Dr. David Sullins and others, Dr. Irv Suchoff in ACOE. Wonderful role models, wonderful mentors. So I'd say every s small and big step of the way, I've been truly fortunate, like all of us have. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to think how things might have been different. Mm -hmm. I'd say where there was a bit of a difference was when I was back at IU, 1984, I was there for 13 years. I was an off-site clinic director, so I was 50 miles away from the main campus in Bloomington, which I loved in so many ways, but I really found that I had to make an effort to make sure I st stayed connected. Um, I did go through the promotion process to, and tenure at IU, and I really needed to make sure I understood what that meant mm -hmm. at the personal level, and that I fulfilled what the university expected and what the school expected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just talk a little bit about that off-site uh, clinic experience. Um, as I was looking, it looks like you've been involved in at least three of those over, yes. over the years. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that was a little bit about and how that worked into your education and experience and all that kind of thing. Yes. So after I finished my residency program, uh, two-year program, I was fortunate to be a, my first faculty role was at the Pennsylvania College of mm -hmm. Optometry, and I was chief of a primary care module at the two-year-old Eye Institute at that time, mm -hmm. yeah, which was really exciting. I got a call from IU, my mentor, Dr. Dan Gersman. They were opening a new off-site clinic in Indianapolis. In 1976, they had established one a couple miles north of the combined Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis campus mm -hmm. in Indianapolis that was um, directed by Dr. Jim Hunter. That was 1976. This was 1984. IU and the campus was helping to promote urban development around the IUPUI campus. Indianapolis itself was undergoing urban renewal in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. So um, the school was asked to form a new clinic. Um, it was a, a small clinic right on the fringe of campus, across the street from campus, in a wonderful building, the Madam C.J. Walker Theater Building. And Madam C.J. Walker was the first African-American female to become a self-made millionaire based upon her hair care mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. So the building held, housed the manufacturing plant, it, held, it housed a theater on the top level, mm -hmm. and we were in part of that building. Um, what I loved about that is I had envisioned myself being a career academic, mm -hmm. but the opportunity to direct this small extern off-site campus clinic was kind of like having my own private practice, right. but with the academic connection. Mm -hmm. Really enjoyed that. Then, in the early 90s, the school decided to combine both clinics into a new building that was just a block away from the Walker Theater building. So the Illinois Street Eye Clinic, the inaugural uh, clinic in Indianapolis, and the Walker Eye Clinic that I helped, helped to open, we combined those into a new 12,000 square foot facility uh, called the Indianapolis Eye Care Center, and that opened in November of 92. Oh. Mm -hmm. And it was really special, as you might imagine, we were all excited to combine the two clinics, to have 
mutual involvement with each other and to be in this brand new facility. And um, to respond further to your question, not only did I love the academically linked practice, if you will, wonderful patients, love caring for the patients, wonderful students, but we formed wonderful connections to the community. As you know firsthand, in building a practice, that's so essential. So we took every opportunity to reach out, to do screenings, and really, truly enjoy that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. That's good, that's good. So tell us a little bit about Linda Kasser when she's not in an optometry venue. Mm -hmm. What kind of interests, hobbies, things would we find her doing? Mm. I would say um, early in my life I was a sailor. In fact, that was, one could argue that was my earliest teaching experience. When I was in college, I taught sailing at the Milwaukee Yacht Club during the summers. And when I was at Northwestern, I was fortunate to be on their sailing team. So I always enjoyed sailing. Um, once my family stopped sailing, I haven't done it firsthand, but anytime we would travel to a locale that had a sailing opportunity, that we enjoyed doing that. Love culture events, love music, love traveling, love being with family and friends. So I would say cultural events and traveling would be the first that come to mind. Well, and, and through your responsibilities with volunteer optometry, you, you had opportunity to travel to lots of different yes. places. Yes. Always fun to find an opportunity to get some sort of event or yes. something to be involved in that. Yes, and I think like all of us, those opportunities have resulted in li lifelong friends mm -hmm. from different countries, different parts of the United States. And as I mentioned, although it may not sound the best, we didn't always plan those moves, mm -hmm. but wherever we lived, we enjoyed it mm -hmm. and truly have friends literally from all over the country. So as you kindly mentioned, when we had opportunities to travel, either internationally or domestically, we tried to fold in visits with friends mm -hmm. as we attended meetings, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. So your career has seen you as a staff optometrist in a low vision clinic as director of these off-campus clinics, as we described, uh, recognized leader in organized volunteer optometry, dean of one of the optometry colleges, an author, lecturer. What do you point to at this point in your career as your most lasting, meaningful, or significant contribution thus far? I would say, again, at the risk of being flippant, all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, I pride myself, thanks to Dr. Catania, Dr. Fingeret, Dr. Thorne, Dr. Wickham, I pride myself when I was a clinician as being a primary care optometrist. Mm -hmm. Obviously I didn't have depth of expertise in contact lenses, low vision, binocular vision, but I truly believe I practiced to the primary care level within each of those areas of our profession. Mm -hmm. Um, and then obviously collaborated with those who had greater expertise when the patient's needs dictated that. What I l have truly valued and loved about being an optometric educator is the opportunity for the variety of activities that you've been kind enough to mm -hmm. highlight. Yeah. Um, so I'd say all of the above, mm -hmm. unless that sounds very strange or no, odd. Mm -hmm. And again, just as I tried to articulate earlier, the hope of having done each of those well um, having met wonderful colleagues, students, who and watching them succeed and be um, even better mm -hmm. um, is wonderful. Um, and just working with truly wonderful people and trying to make a difference. Mm -hmm. okay. What would you tell someone who's still in optometry school, mm -hmm. who sees you and says, she's inspirational. Mm -hmm. I would aspire to be like her in my career. Would like to have a career similar to yours or be like you, so to speak. How would you counsel them, or what would you tell them would be the things they need to kind of think about or do, uh, or even prepare for that mm -hmm. they would think, oh, it looks all great, you know, on the outside, and maybe there's difficulties. I don't know. How would you how would you counsel somebody like that? Mm -hmm. I guess I would approach it in several ways, several dimensions. First of all, make the most of every opportunity maybe be a little more purposeful in planning than I was in the last 44 years, but yet being open to wonderful opportunities that maybe we didn't think about, or even in what I've experienced with interprofessional education or my dental accrediting experience, to be open to new and different things, 
to, to view the world broadly, to view the world broadly and also view our profession broadly. Certainly to make a difference. But also, I had the wonderful opportunity to provide the keynote presentation at this summer's ASCO Summer Institute for Faculty Development. And as I thought a lot about what message to share with those younger colleagues, I decided to center my comments around four C's, confidence, communication, collaboration, and compassion. Confidence was purposefully first, because I really feel we all need to project confidence within our profession, interprofessionally, uh, role model confidence to our students, and certainly as we care for patients, to demonstrate confidence to patients and their family members. Communication, to do it well. My tendency is to do it professionally rather than informally. Um, and to really choose our words carefully and our written words carefully. Collaboration, all for it, within our profession, colleagues, and interprofessionally. And then compassion, to be appreciative. And I must say I came across your editorial in the Buckeye Magazine about the attitude of gratitude, mm -hmm. to appreciate others. I like to say thank you as often as I can. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, I would say the council is the what and, and how to do the what, but above all, to be, to do more and bigger things than I did. You know, I've been in the profession 44 years and a lot has changed. Right. And younger colleagues are picking up and they're gonna propel us into the next right. decades. So to, to perhaps appreciate what's come before them, but to build bigger and better and decide how to do that in a professional and commitment to excellence way. Yeah. Well, and the folks that preceded us mm -hmm. did what they could, right? Yes. And would not have probably dreamed of the things that you're able to do mm -hmm. in the years that you've been in the profession. And they would look at it and go, wow, you know, that's great, you know, because I couldn't have done that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so they, everybody comes along and makes a contribution. It's a good thing. Yes, so. yes. And as I'll try to share in the lecture this evening, I really, I'm one, not that I'm alone in this belief by any means, but I really do believe the past may not be perfect, but we have to honor the past, mm -hmm. and understanding it is so important. So. Often, do we wish things were different? Yes. Should we erase that? Not necessarily, because you're right, that's how we got to where we are. And those beyond us will have different experiences when they come. Mm -hmm. So if there was something in your life that you could redo, what would it be? Hmm. I would say, happily not a lot. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yes. Um, I would say the one thing maybe I wish I had done, which I do share with junior colleagues, and I've shared, especially in the context of the ASCO Summer Institute for Faculty Development, there is a part of me that wishes, and Ohio State's a shining example of that, that I had pursued an advanced degree. Mm -hmm. um, as you were kind enough to mention, when I graduated, I had caught the bug of therapeutics. Mm -hmm. So I went the residency route rather than, say, a PhD mm -hmm. route. But to me, the PhD appropriately is the universal academic credential. Right. And there were times I wish I had had that experience um, to maybe have a deeper understanding of research and the mentoring collaborative relationships that evolved from that, mm -hmm. plus the credential to me is invaluable. So I would say happily, no regrets. If I do, I try not to think about them, but that might be one thing that sometimes I wonder, should I have done that? There were points in my career that I thought about going back to get another degree, not necessarily a PhD, maybe a master's in health administration as I was directing clinics. Um, IU op offered that program and I thought that could be very interesting, but then I did not pursue it. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but I'd say that would be my one thought. Well, and, it, and, and I'm not suggesting you should have regrets or yes, anything yes, like that. I'm just yes. thinking, you know, if you look, look back on your career, you know, it, it, look back on life, mm -hmm. for me it'd be to be able to read music. You know, ah, it's one of those yes. things that I just never have developed. And I feel I would be enriched by being able to do that. You know, mm -hmm. being able to play a guitar or something like that would be pretty cool. Yes. You know. 
but you know, it's probably it's a little later in life to be doing that, so I don't know. I could, but yeah, I don't know. I do play handbells, although I don't really read music, but I'm an excellent counter. So once I know which note I'm on, <laughs> or two notes, <laughs> yeah. then I'm excellent. Yeah. So, <laughs> I hope. There's hope for some of us. Exactly. So that's good. What do you wish you had done less of in your life? Hmm. Well, again, happily, not much. Um, I remember vividly when I was in my mid-30s and, again, directing clinics, getting involved in the State Association, the AOA, thinking, you know, I am genuinely enjoying this and I'm going to just keep doing what I can do for as long as I can. So, happily, I, I can't think of anything. I mean, we can all say, do we wish we had worked less? Do we wish maybe we had traveled less for meetings and been more at home? But again, happily for me, they were all enriching. Mm -hmm. And then last question for me. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you wish you had done more of in your life? Mm -hmm. Well, I do love to travel. And well, my husband and I had wonderful travel opportunities. Um, and I wish we had had more trips. We especially like to cruise because to me, I'm a horrible packer. So it was great to get on the boat, unpack once, but the scenery changes all around you. Um, so I wish we'd had more opportunities to do that. Um, I was truly fortunate to have a wonderful husband without whom I could not have done what I did. He was my best cheerleader, my best encourager. Um, so I'd say travel, mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully there will be some more opportunities for that. Travel is a wonderful thing. It is. Very rich. Mm -hmm. and I, I did read a quote one time years ago, which I truly believe in. Um, it went something like, and I'm afraid I can't attribute it to the person who deserves credit, but something like, the world is a book. Those who do not travel read only one page. And, you know, some people, unfortunately, decide not to, I mean, their decision may not travel or may not have opportunities mm -hmm. to travel. But I truly believe that. Every trip has been enjoyable. And we have had friends that we've met on trips mm -hmm. that we've kept since the time we first met. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you're right. Every trip can be, you can learn from every, yes. anything you do. Yes. And particularly travel, you can be enriched in so many ways mm -hmm. and meet people and it's a wonderful mm -hmm. So those are the questions that I have, but we do have a few folks here in the, in the audience who may have questions for you. Mm -hmm. So we'll open it up and see if they have any. Mm -hmm. If they don't, then we'll just, we'll close, but mm -hmm. we'll give them the opportunity. Because I know some of them, and they like to have questions for every single lecture. So. <laughs> yeah. mm. Dr. Moody, what questions would you have today? <laughs> so Linda, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Um, hearing that you've got like over 400 lectures in your in your CV is uh, is pretty remarkable. Um, I think of you as like one of the most consistent presenters that uh, that I can think of in our world. Um, do you have any any secrets or, or thoughts on on your process to keep that quality going and, and keep this consistent level of energy over a long career and a lot of lectures? How do, you, how do you keep it? Uh, how do you keep it high quality and, and high energy? How do you maintain that consistent CASER product? Well, thank you, thank you. Well, um, as again, I'm repeating myself. My apologies, but I was fortunate, in my opinion, because I enjoyed it, to enter the profession near the front end of the use of therapeutics. So a lot of my lecture opportunities related to continuing education programs in states that were looking to change their statutory authority and expand their scope of practice. So when I was an active clinician, the lectures directly related to what I was doing clinically, and I, to use your word, passionate, I was so enthused and passionate about that that I enjoyed hopefully capturing that in my lectures. And then with hopefully being an academic at heart and in mind, I genuinely enjoy putting lectures together, thinking through how best to organize them, how to share my message in an effective way. Um, toward my uh, final years at PCO, before I retired, I taught case-based courses and genuinely enjoy, in fact, Dr. Catania years ago designed this format. We used transparencies on an overhead projector in kind of an interactive, case-based approach. 
um, involving the audience and really enjoyed that. So I've always enjoyed the case-based approach. In my courses, I often involved cases involving my own eyes or my family members' eyes, and those always caught the students' attention. Um, so I'd say in general, knowing the topic, putting in the time, energy, and passion to make it interesting and well-organized, and then the delivery, the communication, um, and hopefully having it be of interest to the audience and engaging the audience. Thank you. Other questions that we might have from other audience members? Dr. Zadnick? So speaking of students, um, when you were at Pacific as Associate Dean and then when you were um, at PCO at Pennsylvania College of Optometry as Dean, I think those students used to follow you around at meetings like you were the Pied Piper. <laughs> I mean, your students would just talk about you, oh, Dr. Kasser. How, what advice would you give administrators to foster that same kind of loyalty and, dare I say, love oh, from you. their students? Well, I don't remember in them <laughs> if, if that was your perception in a good perception way. Perception is. I'm, okay, I, I'm grateful for Although, if I may add an anecdote, if there's time, um, at one of the academy meetings, uh, I think this, it was 2019 in Orlando, I think, um, one of the speakers was my former student at Pacific, and some of my PCO students were in the audience, so I introduced my former Pacific student speaker to the students, and the speaker was kind enough to say to my current students, listen to everything she says. And my students said, we already do, <laughs> which warmed my heart. So again, I think to ask them would be the better folks to ask. But again, I just hope they would see in me a quality role model, someone who's had experience that I can try to impart or bring to whatever we're collaborating on or working on. I am one who truly values student involvement, um, certainly faculty involvement, but when I was dean, I formed a dean student advisory board that was very engaged. It was not in name only. And I also, um, since I had come from back to PCO from the national board, I had a student liaison, national board liaison, that the student and I would communicate before conveying messages to our students about the national boards. So I think the students saw that their perspective was valued. Hopefully they saw that I had a valuable perspective to share with them. And that really gets to my earlier point about how we do what we do. Um, again, it's me. I realize not everyone may agree with it. It's generational, no doubt about it. But I've always leaned toward the professionalism approach because to me that serves well, it serves students well, it serves faculty colleagues well. And if we go too informal too fast, I think it's hard to kind of regroup to the professional line when it's needed, mm -hmm. say if a student is falling short or a colleague, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. but thank you for thank sharing you. that. Any other questions from the group? Dr. Nixon. So first of all, I'm thrilled that you're able to be here on campus for us to honor your, your career and contributions. Um, I'm, I'm curious about what you think the future holds for both optometry and um, optometric education? Hmm. Well, I would say I'm a little removed from it currently, and I've certainly been removed where some of the in some, from some of the arenas where that's being actively discussed. But I would say, to answer your question indirectly, I'm not sure I have the answers, but what I hope for is quality, deep debate and discussion. That's been an interesting perspective that I've gleaned, albeit somewhat superficially, from my interprofessional work. It's been interesting to watch other professions expand their scope of practice, to watch other professions have what I perceived as purposeful discussion among the profession in a collegial way about how to change their curriculum. So my hope would be that for our profession that we continue to tell the world who we are and what we do, that they turn to us for what we do at the highest level, 
and that they're clear about how we fit into the healthcare arena. Um, and that, especially as um, a profession as, and as optometric educators, that we continue to collaborate purposefully on what our future looks like and obviously to forge our future rather than have it dictated toward for us. I think, again, my opinion is given the size of our profession, we have opportunities to do that that we may not have always seized compared to a profession like dentistry, which is much bigger and much more diverse. So I would say I wish we would harness that opportunity more than I feel we have, but perhaps it's already underway, and obviously I'm just not part of it. Mm -hmm. But thank you. Any other questions from our audience? Dr. Moody? Well, I'm just sort of interested in that theme, and I, I had no idea that you had these, these interprofessional uh, associations and were involved in, in dental accreditation, but I'm not surprised <laughs> that they chose you. But uh, I mean, I think optometry is, is our landscape is, is challenged a little bit mm -hmm. by new programs. Yes. And I would say challenged because I'm not sure that our applicant pool supports mm -hmm. that sort of expansion with maintaining quality for, for uh, you know, and chances for, for successful completion for all applicants. Yes. Yes. Is, is the landscape in dentistry challenged in, in a similar way? And have, are there any insights from dentistry or any other profession that you're aware of that might help us navigate through challenges of expansion, not of, not of scope of practice, but of um, programs that are, that are training future professionals? Yes. I don't want to misrepresent my knowledge of dentistry on that particular question, okay. but my impression, and again, um, others who are closer to it may disagree. My impression is that there is a lot of thinking about um, the value of higher ed, even at the undergraduate level, um, and the cost of education, and to answer maybe, to circle back to Dr. Mix Dixon's question, mm -hmm. is what we train, our, train and educate our students to do what they do in practice, depending mm -hmm. on where they choose to practice. Two things I would share from my knowledge of dentistry, but remember in what role that comes from. Dentistry does an excellent job of articulating specialties. I'm not sure we've done the best job at that, and sometimes we've avoided it. That said, dentistry has a lot of specialties, and I feel they're starting to think about how to navigate a plethora of specialties and even new and emerging specialties. The second thing I would cite that I learned a few years ago when I was at the um, commission meeting is that and I believe I'm reporting this correctly, and it's also been true in Australia. I happen to have an opportunity to give a, uh, a presentation remotely for the strategic planning session of the Optometry Council of Australia and New Zealand, uh, and I shared this with them, and it turns out they have a similar model. The state of Minnesota decided it had underserved communities for dentistry, so the state legislature actually created a new level of profession, professional that they call dental therapists. So the profession didn't do it, the state legislature did. It's like a mid-level. Mm -hmm. So again, to perhaps avoid controversy, I'm wondering, based on what our graduates do and where they practice, should we have different levels? I'm not saying we should, but I would think we should think about it or look at it. And I believe there have been some discussions about that a few years ago. But what I really appreciate about dentistry's approach is my sense was, and again, they may disagree, that they may not have been totally thrilled with the state legislature in Minnesota establishing that, but they totally embraced it within their accrediting process. So dentistry accredits everything dental related, dental laboratories, assistants, hygienists, dental therapists, what they call pre-doctoral, be it DDS or DMD, 
up through all of the specialties. It's all under a single accrediting umbrella. And that has immense value to me from what I've seen as a public member. And our profession, as we know, has not gone that direction. So I would Absolutely. love to see that type of thinking perhaps come our way as well. Any other questions that we might have from our audience? Dr. Kasser, we're, we're honored that you're here. We're uh, grateful that uh, you've accepted uh, the opportunity to be the Myers lecturer, and we look forward to your presentation this evening. And uh, we congratulate you uh, on a wonderful career and uh, being open and vulnerable with your comments today. Oh, thank so, you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Truly so, my honor. Thank you so much. And that, we will close our interview for today.